Okay, hello to our supermajority community. When the music fades, it is my cue. So welcome, it's so exciting to be here today. My name is Emma Reddick, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm calling into this book club today from Brooklyn, New York. So shout out to the other members on this call today in New York City. Um, drop a hello into the chat, wherever you're calling in from. Um, I love to see that the might, the might that we flex across this country as a community. So it's always really exciting. We're usually coast to coast. I know we have folks on the call on the West Coast, all the way through the middle, all the way over here to New York. Um, if you're on the East Coast, I hope you're staying warm. It was a snowy weekend. Um, so please drop that into the chat if you would like where you're calling in from today. And if you feel so inclined, maybe drop a word or a few words to describe what's bringing you to this book club today. When I gather with the supermajority community, I love to do this exercise and reflect on what brings me to supermajority and the work that we do to center racial justice, to hold our elected officials accountable, work with volunteers in our community to make our majority rules real. And I like to think about really what lights me up when I wake up in the morning to do this work because to say it is hard sometimes is an understatement. So I've asked you to drop into the chat what brings you here today. And for me, there's a powerful, powerful line in the novel that we're discussing today that articulates what brings me to this work. And if you have your copy of the book already, I wanna invite you um, to turn to page 105. Um, there's a line that resonates with me and reminds me of what brings me to this work. And it's um, from a chapter entitled Black Future. And it reads, what good is any form of literature to black people? And that's a quote directly from Octavia Estelle Butler. And this line resonated with me as an organizer, as a black woman, a black reader and bookworm, and even as a black writer myself, or I try. And it connects directly to the very foundations of this supermajority book club. What good is any form of literature to black people, to non-binary people, to indigenous people, to disabled folks, to all of us and in our intersecting identities? To me, any form of literature for black people is our legacy, our stories, our past and future, our present, our families, our friends, our ideas, our hopes, our travesties, our collective experiences, and our indiv individualistic stories. So please share, whether from the book or not, what brings you to this moment, or what good any form of literature is to you. I'm loving to see this in the chat, um, as well as where folks are dialing in from today. So with that, let's get started. I've spoken enough. You're here today as part of our supermajority community, and whether you're new to us, new to our book club, or deeply entrenched in all things supermajority, I want to start off really quickly by sharing who we are. So supermajority was founded by Cecile Richards, Ai-jen Poo, Alicia Garza, Jess morales Roquetto, Catherine Granger, and Deirdre Schiffling to solve one big problem. Women are the majority of Americans, voters, volunteers, and donors, and yet we and the issues that matter most to us get ignored by candidates and elected. So Supermajority was born from the idea of an activism hub for women to come together across our country, identity, age, geography, and issue. And we've contacted millions of voters ahead of the 2020 election and ahead of Virginia's 2021 election. We've created a member portal where you can learn about what it means to be a Supermajority member and part of our community from volunteer opportunities to discounts at your favorite places to member events like this one. So this is all to say that our work is to create this activism hub as the supermajority, as a place for you to come be in community and take lasting action. And we do this by training volunteers and leaders to take action in both elections and their own communities. We create programs to empower women voters. We create events and spaces for our members to share their stories as a supermajority community. And today we're doing this by coming together as a community. The last note I want to add is here at Supermajority, when we say women, we include all gender identities and expressions. Womanhood can be defined by femininity, and our definition of women is as expansive as the world we want to live in. So we welcome women, gender fluid, gender non-binary, two-spirit, trans folks, and anyone who else who identify with or as women. Another aspect that brings us together today is the ability to come together to read and discuss this amazing published piece. This moment deserves a moment of appreciation for the author, Evie Savoy, who wrote this book and told the story of Black experience, history, futurism, storytelling, science, other dimensions, girlhood, and revolution. I also want to include a moment of appreciation to the entire Supermajority team for pulling together this event from start to finish, because it was truly a team event from start to finish. And of course, the amazing bookstore Harriet's who provided copies of the book for this event. 
When we set out to start this book club, we knew that we wanted to read books that centered our majority rules. We wanted books written by women of color across all genres. And we knew we wanted to partner with locally and woman owned bookstores. When the team decided, decided to reach out to both Harriet's and E.B. Zaboy, we knew we could create a book club event that matched the goals for our work every day here. Black women have stories to tell, novels to write, science fiction worlds to create, legacies and histories to share in words both spoken and written. Our book club today is inspired by this and Harriet's bookshop. These legacies and stories, science fiction worlds, our individual stories are ours to both create and honor. So with that, I wanna pass the mic to our partner for the event, Harriet's Bookshop. Harriet's Bookshop, named for the historical heroine Harriet Tubman, celebrates women authors, women artists, and women activists. Janine A. Cook opened the small independent bookstore in Philadelphia in February, 2020, and she's here with us today. So hi, Janine, I wanna pass it over to you. Hi, hi all, and welcome. You are, uh, you're virtually in Harriet's Bookshop, and Harriet's Bookshop, as you can see right now, is an ever-changing, ever-evolving space. Literally, it's changing before your eyes as you watch this. Um, I'm so excited to be here representing Harriet. I'm Janine A. Cook. Um, but it, it really, we're doing this work under the guiding light of Harriet Tubman, uh, and we like to make, to make space for Harriet and for the others who make moments like this possible for us, whose shoulders we stand on. And so we'll take a second, a little, a little, a little time um, of quiet, <laughs> which is gonna be very strange because you're on this like internet world. Um, and in that quiet time, I invite you to think about who is with you, right? Who walks with you and, and who speaks to you and who speaks through you. Uh, and, and also to, to give, to give um, some time and space to hold some space for who those people might be. And I'm just gonna start that time now. Okay, so nice. In the chat, I invite you to think about who that was and to give them a name in the chat box. For us, of course, is Harriet. I also have my team Butler shirt on today uh, because of course we wouldn't be here tonight had it not been for the, for the magical powers of a time traveling Octavia Butler who has decided to join us yet again uh, in, in this century. And so uh, in the chat box, one ancestor whose shoulders you stand on. Nobody, you, nobody has an ancestor whose shoulders they stand on? Oh, okay. Keep them coming. Thank you. Yes, so we give thanks for our grandmothers, for our queens, for Della, for Lavina, for your mother, right? And you can keep going or you could choose not to, but we know that we're, we didn't get here alone and that the future depends on us right now, right? Someday we will be someone's ancestor and they will likely be calling on us as well. Uh, and so again, I give thanks. I give thanks for all of you being here with us today. Just know that Harriet's Bookshop, yes, we are a bookshop, um, but we are also way more than a bookshop. And so consider us a resource, consider us a partner, consider us a friend, uh, uh, consider us when you are thinking about what, what books you might wanna read next. Uh, and so again, thank you. And AB, congratulations on another beautiful work, Super Majority. Thank you for bringing folks together. This is how that work is done. Uh, and thank y'all. Thank you so much, Janine, for sharing and for sharing and for encouraging us to reflect on this moment as we continue to navigate this discussion. I think to talk about where we are now, it's really powerful when we're brought into community to think about where we come from, where we hail from together. Um, also loving to see those folks continue to drop that into the chat. And so I want to invite that if you're still pondering, you're still thinking throughout this book event, continue to drop those ancestors whose shoulders you stand on. Um, I think that's a beautiful thing to guide this event as we move forward. So thank you to Harriet. With that, I also want to talk a little bit about what Supermajority's guiding force is. Um, and that is that our book club today is also centered on the work that we do here, grounded in our majority rules. 
Um, so earlier I mentioned a little bit about our majority rules, and these were a set of rules gathered from women all over the country, rules that once actualized create a world centered around gender and racial equality. So our majority rules are, our rule, are rules that we live by and we believe our work should be guided by every day. And that is that our lives are safe, our bodies are respected, our work is valued, our families are supported, our government represents us, and a super rule that ties all of these together, and that is that the lives and experiences of women, particularly women of color, are front and center in addressing all of our nation's challenges. And so I invite you also to keep these somewhere in the back of your mind as perhaps you're thinking of your ancestors and the, the folks that came before you. This is the work that stands up our, these are the words that stand up our work at Supermajority. So with that, let's jump in. I wanna cover a quick agenda and share what this next hour together is going to look like and feel like, and then I promise I will stop talking. So at the beginning of this event, I wanted the chance to say hello and welcome all of you folks. Um, we're now gonna jump straight into a Q&A with today's author. We're gonna finish off today with a discussion as a member community and share a reader guide with you that our team created to support parent readers as they navigate this book through the lens of the supermajority community. And then we're gonna wrap the call and prepare you for other ways to be part of our supermajority community. So to do this well, we have a few norms that we would love for you to follow. Um, and that's really to ensure that this event feels like it is focused on our author, on our majority rules. And so if possible, please come on camera. We'd love to see your faces and get as close to feeling like this is um, not a pandemic virtual event, but that we're all in this together. Um, please stay on mute unless you've been promoted to do otherwise. And this is just so we don't interrupt the wisdom that we're about to receive during this call. Please keep all chat in the chat box relevant to discussion, but please feel free to keep the chat box lively. Drop in ideas, reactions, ideas. I said that twice, but I'm excited. <laughs> so please feel free to use that chat box as a resource for community. And let's remember to encourage and uplift one another so that this is as safe as a place as we can possibly make it. If you agree to with these norms, if you could put a plus in the chat, that's kind of your virtual way of signing on and saying, yes, I'm with you. Let's make this event as incredible as we can as an audience. And it makes our book club events seamless. So we appreciate you being in that with us, seeing lots of pluses in the chat. So thank you for that. So we have some busy time ahead of us. We have two supermajority team members leading this conversation today with Evie Zaboy about her novel, Star Child, a biological constellation of Octavia Estelle Butler. So with that, I wanna introduce some folks and then I'm gonna pass it to them to kick this off. First, I wanna introduce Grace Caldara. She is the community engagement manager on Supermajority's community engagement team. She supports the management, engagement, and community education of the organization's associated Facebook group of over 3 million members, working to elevate personal stories and lived experiences from women from across the country that are grounded in the majority rules. She manages a team of highly trained and dedicated group of moderators and volunteers who work to de-escalate -escal arguments, facilitate, facilitate challenging discussions, and educate community members on racism, equity, and justice in our on online community. Prior to Supermajority, Grace was a scientist and an adjunct professor. Most recently, she was the director of engagement for the Pantsuit Nation Foundation, and she was a writing contributor to the book Pantsuit Nation, or the Pantsuit Nation book. She received her BS from Boston College and her MS and PhD from the University of California, Irvine. And when she's not chasing her kids or doing all of that other incredible thing, all those other incredible things, you can find her reading a book or planning the next beach vacation. Grace, you have me tongue tied. <laughs> Jessica Herrera is the next person I'd love to introduce. She serves as Supermajority's communications director, leading the organization's work to shift narrative and build women's power using strong movement-wide messaging strategies. She has worked in nonprofit communications for more than a decade, producing news content, creating and implementing communications plans, and developing strong relationships with reporters and editors during that time. Most recently, Jessica, or we know her as Jess, directed communications for a voting rights organization. She has also driven media strategy at leading environmental organizations such as the Sierra Club and Center for Biological Diversity. Before diving into advocacy communications, Jess cut her teeth as a reporter and writer. She also spent time as a labor organizer. She holds a master's degree in international studies from the John Hopkins University. Jessica was born in Chicago, Illinois, but now lives in Tuscan, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona. You both have me tongue tied with her husband, two kiddos and two dogs. Jess loves hiking and running. And when it gets too hot in the old Pueblo, she can be found camping in the Sonoran Desert Sky Islands. 
So today, Grace and Jess will be speaking with author E.B. Zaboy. E.B. Zaboy was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. She has written numerous books for young readers, including American Street, a National Book Award finalist, and My Life as an Ice Cream Sandwich, a New York, New York Times bestseller. She co-authored the best-selling and award-winning Punching in the Air with prison reform activist Youssef Salam of the Exonerated Five. And she is the author of Okoye, the People, a Black Panther novel. I'm sorry, Okoye to the People, a Black Panther novel. Raised in New York City, Ebi now lives in New Jersey with her husband and their three children. So with that, I am starstruck. I am tongue-tied. So over to you, Grace and Jess, to kick off this discussion. Hi, thank you so much, Emma, for your uh, introduction. I am so excited to be here and to be in conversation with Evie today. Um, I am also a parent of three kids. They're two, six, and eight, so life is quite hectic. Um, and I'm based out of Boston, so we've gotten recently slammed with lots of snow, so it's been uh, quite the weekend here. Um, so we just want to really start out uh, by saying this was such an amazing read, Evie, um, and we were all really excited to read it. I was very excited to read it with my kid. Um, Star Child is a young adult novel for ages about 10 plus, um, and it's a biography about Octavia Estelle Butler, uh, and it's a book that you could read as an adult, you can read it as a family with your kids. Um, I started reading it with my eight-year-old and it's been a lot of fun and he's really enjoyed it. Uh, and through all of this, as Emma has shared, a super majority, we are guided by a majority rules. And this book really, there's so many that that intersect with this book. Um, specifically, our rule number three, our work is valued, um, which really includes centering narratives and stories that are written about, by, and for Black girls and women, as well as women and girls of color. Um, and Star Child really is directly connected with this rule, um, with Octavia Sell Butler's mom working as a domestic worker to the dismissal she had from her teachers, um, writing her stories, um, and then her continued rejection letters um, that she was receiving as she was trying to get her writing published. So as being a parent yourself and a Black woman um, and an author of this biography, what do you really hope um, that young readers and their parents will take away from reading and learning about um, Octavia Butler's life? Thank you. First, I want to thank you, Grace, and thank you, Jess, and thank you, Supermajority, for having me. Uh, I do want to uh, take some time to say how much I appreciate the space that is cultivated here through certain language, um, setting a tone by using certain vocabulary. Um, it, it feels like a homecoming to me. I am a published author, but within the publishing space, within the book world, there are different words and phrases that are used, um, but I am also coming from the grassroots community organizing um, tradition. Um, those were my first jobs. Um, I worked for Sadie Nash Leadership um, Project. I worked for Girls Right Now. Um, there used to be an organization called Dua Fum. All of these are were feminist grassroots nonprofit organizations that created a certain kind of vocabulary around inclusive, inclusivity, um, around dismantling oppressive systems. Uh, so all these things I learned alongside becoming a writer. And this was also part of the world that Octavia Butler cultivated in her novels. So I just want to acknowledge the space of grassroots community organizing, coming together in this way, having specific language and vocabulary around a common objective and literature. So this is my two worlds colliding. Um, I want to, to, to answer your question. Uh, this is a, um, it's a young adult, it's for young adults, teens, and it's also middle grade, um, middle grade readers. So this is for 10 and up specifically um, because Octavia Butler wrote her first novel or what we can see what's documented and what's in her papers at the age of 10. 
at the age of 10, I saw her first manuscript, if you will, uh, several loose leaf pages that were once taped together, but I saw the, uh, the loose pages um, about a story. And there was close to 50 pages that she worked on over time and she revised. And it was called Silver Star. And it was a story about a family of magical horses. And it was less magical and more science fiction. Um, horses who got their superpowers from fallen stars. And she was 10 years old and the year was 1957. And we have an idea of what was happening in our world and in this country in 1957, the civil rights movement, the space race, the beginnings of the Cold War, uh, 10 years after World War II, um, Russian invasion, fear of communists, Red Scare, McCarthyism, a lot of things were happening in her world. But as a little Black girl, it seemed, at least from what was documented, that she cared less about what was happening with race and more about what was happening outside the par parameters of our planet Earth. I want young readers to understand that a Black child in the 1950s was, was thinking like that. And she was not um, being humdrum and being sad about race and really, really thinking about the civil rights movement in that way. In the same way that we are experiencing a pandemic, we just came out of the racial reckoning of 2020, a certain kind of presidency. There are Black children, there are children of color who are thinking outside the parameters of our reality to create magical stories, to create otherworldly and extraterrestrial stories. And we need to encourage that sort of imagining, imaginative thinking so that they can create a world that we can't even imagine just now. We need radical imagination. So this novel is about an, uh, a girl who was tapping into radical imagination in 1957 at a time that we don't associate radical imagination to Black children or and specifically girls. Phoebe, it's like you read my next question. <laughs> Well, before I jump in, what I want to reiterate is just how excited I am to be in conversation with you. Um, one of the reasons I so quickly volunteered to be a part of this book club and to, to lead this discussion was the opportunity to share Octavia Butler's story with my own daughter, who is seven. Um, Octavia S. L. Butler's writing influences include her identity as a Black girl growing up in what you define as an era and a zeitgeist riddled with racism and racial politics, the space race, the Red Scare and McCarthyism, as well as the proliferation of the American dream as the nuclear family and so on. And as I read, all of those themes really just felt pertinent right now. Our own children are currently living through an era in a zeitgeist that feels as formative as the era that influenced Octavia and her radical imagination. For example, my daughter was a kindergartner when the pandemic started. She's lived through a presidential election unlike any before, she has seen and felt deepening racism and racial politics, and she's witnessing the space exploration and, and space race that's undertaken by private companies. So I'm wondering what inspired you to write this novel specifically for children and young adults? And also, did the present zeitgeist serve as an inspiration for you? Uh, the, so the present zeitgeist did not serve as an inspiration because it had not happened yet when I first sold this book. I sold it in 2015 and it's taken six years to complete, although it's a very short and small book, writing about someone's imagination, um, a very, very, very cerebral life, uh, Octavia Butler lived the life of the mind. How do I capture that in story form? It's very hard to do, especially for young readers. This first started as a picture book um, and there are quite a number of picture book biographies about you know, historical figures who did things throughout their lives. Octavia um, had accomplished a lot, but in terms of physically doing something, she did not, there was not much that she did physically to document. Uh, so in 2015, of course, we did not have um, the Trump pres presidency yet. 2020 had not happened, but it was Octavia Butler's life within the context of a certain era was important enough for me to pursue. I studied with Butler in 20, 2001, um, 20 years ago. Um, I met her in 2000. I read her 
um, in 2000 as well. And we share a birthday and I feel the kinship there. It's not as superficial as sharing a birthday, um, but because I'm really, really into astrology uh, <laughs> and how the stars align, I do feel like there's something there. And it's not so much that I want to write like her or write anything like her. Um, I see her kind of girlhood is similar to mine in that she was incredibly awkward and cerebral. And I want awkward girls, cerebral girls, um, girls who don't quite fit in, but are incredibly imaginative to read this book and find some kinship there. Uh, so it's not just that she became a science fiction writer, it's that she was called, she was considered herself shy and the adults in her life, or her, the adults in her life dismissed her and even were cruel in calling her backwards or slow. Uh, even teachers did not see her genius and did not think that her imaginative stories were worth, you know, were worth publishing or were worth anything, or worth an A. Um, so she got, she did not have good grades. Um, she did not do well in school because she was daydreaming and she did not do well with friends because she was an only child and she was really, really into her own headspace. So that's another angle. That's another entry point for children and anyone. It's 10 to infinity. Um, when I say this is uh, for uh, middle school, um, middle schoolers, it's also for high schoolers and college age um, readers and adults to read this, this is an entry point into Octavia Butler and others will write an adult uh, biography or different kinds of biography, but I want people to enter, enter her story if they're not familiar with her through the lens of a 10 year old girl, because this is where we get her the first writing from her. I wanna, I wanna unpack some of what you just said a little bit. Um, and you talk about how you and Octavia Butler actually share a birthday, um, which to me felt like the universe drawing the linkage between the two of you. Um, but I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about her life and, and her biography that compelled your own writing and your decision to write this book. So I was writing strange, what I consider strange stories before I knew there was an Octavia Butler and before I really understood what science fiction was. Um, I know there are a lot of Twilight Zone fans, but I think for me, I, it was just weird for me to be nine years old and waiting for the 4th of July to happen we had I don't I don't know if um you will remember fourth of July and New Year's Day was when the twi Twilight Zone marathons came on and uh kids would be outside I'm like no I'm waiting for my favorite episode and I'm watching the episodes back to back it was creepy it was black and white Rod Sterling and that creepy you know theme song I loved it not because of the aesthetic but because of the ideas that were presented I was a, the kind of child who got lost in my own thinking um, for anybody who was like that as a child, where I would really think about what does it mean to be human and not in a sociological way, but in a biological, um, historical, quantum physics kind of way. Like, what are we, why are we the ones to be, you know, to create this universe and I'd get lost and you know yeah you get a thought and you lose it and and this is the kind of stuff I would do as a little girl and I had no outlet for that um I had no creative outlet to examine human existence to examine the world that I'm living in I was a little girl in Bushwick um, the neighborhood of Bushwick, then I moved to different parts of Brooklyn and then to Queens and watching the world happen out through a, um, a top floor window. I wasn't allowed to play outside very much. But saying all that to say, I was observant as a child in the same way that Octavia Butler was observant. And if anyone, for anyone who's into astrology, there are certain characteristics that when you share a birthday with someone, you could kind of pick on, you know, pick out the things that make um, the things that make you who you are and make them who they are and find those connections. So to me, that's the connection. Um, when I read her novel, I saw it resonated with me and I did not know we shared a birthday. And I said, this is the kind of stuff I want to write. This is kind of depth I want to examine in my art. And then I saw we share a birthday and I was like, 
it all makes sense. And and I did not pursue like science, hard science fiction like she does. I was just, I just had a huge interest in science fiction. So I'm I'm 44 years old and I was in college when the first Matrix came out. And it was mind blowing. Um, for anyone, Gen X, Ma Matrix changed the game, right? <laughs> um, and everything was, um, as a black artist in New York City, the fact that there was a Morpheus, you know, and some of the ideas were speaking to the black experience and being, you know, being in the matrix and being out of the matrix and then discovering Octavia Butler at the same time and writing sci-fi poetry, because I was also part of the spoken word movement. It was just a moment where um, it was a perfect storm of discovering her writing, um, being into science fiction as a genre, um, feminist science fiction as well. I was taking a course called um, Feminist Science Fiction in college and reading Ursula Le Guin. Um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman had a novel called Her Land. Um, uh, I, I can't remember some of the others, but oh, um, and Marion uh, Zimmer uh, Bradley, if I'm, am I saying her name correctly? But there were some hardcore science fiction, women science fiction authors that I was reading at the same time. I was reading um, Octavia Butler. Oh, Handmaid's Tale, who wrote that? It's late. What's her name again? Okay, yes. <laughs> Um, Margaret Atwood, is, is that her? Margaret Atwood? Okay. I read Handmaid's Tale in 2000. Uh, her Land, Left Hand of Darkness, um, some of other, uh, Ursula Gwynn's other novels. Um, so all of this was just a perfect form of reading alternative thinking, trying to write that sort of story, but not getting published in that genre and getting rejected because I felt like publishers did not think I had the right to write science fiction. They wanted an immigrant story from me because how dare I as an Haitian immigrant write science fiction? What is it that I'm saying in that genre? So that's how I met Octavia Butler. I studied with her and in over the years, I just thought it was valuable for readers to understand the kind of child that she was. I think I went beyond your question, right? <laughs> I'm here for all of it. I'm here for all of it. That was great. <laughs> that was really wonderful. And um, I love that we're starting with her as a child and she, she has become a fixture in the science fiction world and an inspiration to so many people, including yourself. Um, and she's become the representation she didn't have as a kid. Um, and we now, you know, I mean, we've known for a while, but people in society is finally catching on that representation really does matter. Um, and as, as a child, Octavia was gravitating towards science fiction. There weren't necessarily, there weren't writers and she wasn't, there weren't young black girls in the center of the story. So she really put herself in that. Um, and you, you have written um, in the book that at the time all the authors were white men. Um, she was so enthralled with that science fiction that she imagined herself as a little black girl, the hero of those stories, um, and in a lot of ways propelled herself to write herself in, in her books um, and submitting her to stories, but again, being turned away because she wasn't fitting the mold. Uh, how do you feel um, that this really is inspiring to young readers and to parents and people who are just discovering who she is as a writer um, and what she's done for the overall genre? I, I feel that, what well, not so much feelings, it's more thinking <laughs> where, um, again, I keep, I when I'm talking about Octavia Butler and myself as a child, I keep I'm saying the word cerebral. Um, I'll avoid the word nerdy, right? Uh, <laughs> but so being cerebral is you give things more thought than, and then feelings are usually pushed aside. So it's all examining an idea, um, turning it over in your head, that sort of thing. She did a lot of that. And 
I, we know this because these were parts of her journal entries. So, so she was less, I don't know what her feelings were, but when she got to writing things down, she was telling us what her ideas were. And there is a part of her journey where she wrote feeling the word feelings like five times. Um, you must feel, everybody must feel, the reader must feel what the characters are feeling. So this was something that she had to work on. Uh, so when you said feel, um, I'm thinking of the word feel that she had to write down several times as a um, literary device, as a thing to do in her novels to um, create empathy. And that's another thing that she cared about too, um, empathy. Uh, so in that sense, science fiction is not having a moment in on children's literature right now. I think there are a couple of science fiction uh, novels that are published, and I believe it's a science fiction novel that just won the Newbery Award, The Last Quintista, I want to say. So the genre itself where we think about technology's role in humanity, we think about the future, um, it's it's not very popular right now. I don't think I may be speaking. No, it's not. Fantasy does well, but let's say young adult fan, uh, science fiction. I don't see much of that. I'm just waiting for that moment. But what Octavia Butler did was social science fiction. Her parable series were um, set in 2024. She had written it in the uh, the late 90s. But what does our society look like? Ten, what will our society look like 10 years from now? And had she included a pandemic in the uh, parable series, everything would have been, she would have hit everything on the nail. So to I want people to start thinking about science fiction again. We're, you know, I love fantasy. Fantasy is great, magic and, you know, thrones and kings and queens, that's wonderful, and dragons. But where is this technology taking us? I think we're so steep in the world that we're in now that we can't see two steps in, ahead of us in terms of uh, what is TikTok doing to our brain? <laughs> I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos, excuse me. Um, what is social media doing to the way in which we communicate? Uh, what is social media doing to activism and building community, all the things that um, supermajority has defined as their mission? Does technology hinder that or help it in any way? Uh, what is happening with the right and the book banning and how far are they going to go? Um, we think that, you know, the progressives, we think that there are more of us than them, but what if it's not the case and technology is tricking us? So all of these things are science fiction. It doesn't mean that it's robots and space travel. Science fiction is also thinking about where society is going to be just five years from now. A lot has changed in just two years and three years. So part of this is really introducing people to science fiction again and how that came about. There was a red scare in the 1950s. What was that? There was a certain zeitgeist. People were really afraid of nuclear bombs dropping over them. And in some parts of the world, nuclear drop bombs did drop on people, right? The fears that we have, it's probably happened in some um, part of the world. And if we start to examine that through literature, the more the better prepared we are to shift our thinking when these things arise. And to let us know that somewhere in this universe or in this on this planet, people are thinking about the end of the world. And it's probably the end of the world for somebody somewhere. I said a lot. <laughs> You did, but I think it it all ties so well into something that just kept coming front of mind as I was reading this, which is uh, we oftentimes don't think of science fiction as as being relational and as being an important piece of storytelling that builds empathy, but I really think it does, and that Octavia Butler's writing is is very keen to do that, and I think you highlight that in this story so well. Um, and at Supermajority, we truly believe in the power of storytelling, um, whether it's learning from others and their stories as members and volunteers, or learning how to share our own stories to bring about change. Um, and as an author and a storyteller of Octavia Butler's life, I wondered if you could share with our members what storytelling means to you 
particularly science fiction storytelling and why it's important? Storytelling is everything to me. And um, I have not been published really in science fiction. Uh, and it's not to say that I didn't want to. Part of storytelling, storytelling um, and publishing, my publishing journey are two very different things. My publishing journey does not reflect my storytelling journey. I, I'm still in the process of trying to tell the stories that I really want to tell versus the books that I have out there, um, I've published in order to support myself. Um, and it's important for me to say that I am a black immigrant mother of three. My partner is a high school teacher and finances are an important part of my storytelling journey. Um, the things that I want to write about for me to write a science fiction novel requires so much time and intellectual um, space. Um, I need quiet, I need solitude, I need time and all those things take money. And I did not have the money to in order to be able to do that. I was able to write those science fiction stories before I became a mother or when my children were still young. But now with demands, financial demands of raising a family, there isn't much time to do those sorts of deep dive. Um, so in the interim, I take on publishing contracts that mean a lot to me. At the same time, they're a stepping stone to getting to write the things that I want to write. Um, and if this is an organization that serves um, women, all kinds of women, talking about money is very important, um, especially as artists and change makers. How do we support ourselves through the process of bringing about change, whether through our it's through our, our, our art or activism? And part of that process is compromising um, at certain points, especially for uh, marginalized women or women of color. What sorts of compromises do we make along the way in order to get to the point that we want to get to, to do what it is that we are um, sent here to do? And to bring that back to the book, that was also Octavia Butler's journey. Um, there's a part where I talk about all the different parts of science, all the different types of scientists that she is, that she is a biologist. Um, she is a mathematician because I saw how she was working out the finances to be able to support herself. Um, magazines or journals, uh, science fiction journals would pay you per word, pay per word, right? So she would have to calculate the amount of words that she would have to write in order to make a certain kind of money, a certain amount of money to be able to pay rent. So I'm in that same space where I want to write about this thing. Um, how much money will it get me? And is it enough to hold me, you know, until I can write this thing? So all of that is part of the publishing journey and my storytelling journey, which are not one in the same. So publishing is about the money, the career, the work. Storytelling for me is the art. I want to get to a point where I can focus on the art and my art, my true art can support me. So I hope I'm almost there, but I do want to make that point um, here, especially. Thank you for that. And you're right. Like we, money is not always talked about, but in spaces like this, we, it's something we do need to talk about because we have to support ourselves. And it's a lot of decisions we have to make at times as to, am I supporting my family or, or do I need to, can I do this? And, and what can I do to get to my goal and, and all those little incremental steps. Um, and, you know, she, Octavia has done all of that. And it's as women of color, we just experience a lot um, as we try and achieve our dreams and write what we want to write and pursue what we want to do. Um, and I think it's just um, 
really kind of amazing how we've all been able to come together to do this um, and to really lay the groundwork and start having some of these really hard conversations um, about this um, and being really honest with one another so that we can support each other through all of that. Um, and uh, one thing um, you have also talked about is, um, you know, in you mentioned that she was an astronomer and a biologist and a mathematician and things like that. And you chose to um, entitle the book Star Child, A Constellation of Octavia Estelle Butler. Um, and we were wondering if you could share a little bit about why you chose to call it a constellation versus another word or just simply a biography. So in her writing, in her early writing as a teenager and as a college student, she was experimenting. And you don't become that sort of pioneering writer, pioneering artist without trying out, trying your hand at different things. Um, there, while I did not see poetry in her writing, there was um, her experimenting with poetic language her experimenting with details and capturing details or characterization and dialogue. And as a child, she was, she was uh, experimenting with ideas first and foremost, foremost magical horses, horses on Mars. Uh, what do Martians look like? Do Martians all have to be like these blonde women or, and there was a movie called Devil Girl from Mars. Um, and Devil Girls from Mars is something that um, really catapulted her into like hard sci-fi. And she was having, she was just really, really digging deep into what kind of storyteller I want to be. So in that sense, this is not just a biography. This is also me modeling for the young reader how you experiment with form. While this is poetry, here's me writing a poem in the shape of a star. Here's one in the shape of the moon. Here's in uh, a couplet. Here's a haiku. This is about creativity. Um, this is about a creative. So why not me as a creative be creative in how I write about a creative? Um, and I also want educators or librarians to see that too, to point that out to the young readers. What it, why is the author doing all these different things to tell the story? Well, I'm, I'm trying it out. I'm trying something different and new. So this is not just a straight biography. I've heard people call it an ode or say parts of it is memoir. Um, so in order to let the reader know, hey, this is my connection to this author. And this is um, their, her, Octavia Butler's books are mentor texts for me. So me being creative in telling this story is modeling for the young reader, how they can be creative in whatever it is that they want to do. Take risks, try new things is, is the theme of this book. I'm so glad you brought up the poem in the shape of a star and experimenting with different types of poetry, different structural. I mean, just amazing. Every page as I read it, I would show my daughter actually how the words on the page were written because I thought that was just so important. Um, and it's actually something we uh, as a group are going to discuss in just a moment, how we are introducing the story to young readers, how we thought we could be useful in aiding in those discussions. Um, but before we jump into that, Evie, I just want to send one last thank you and huge appreciation for joining us here today, um, discussing this amazing book with us. Um, I truly appreciate both the time you took tonight, but also the time you took to write this book, um, which I think is just an incredibly supportive and useful resource for young readers in those middle years uh, when we are really experimenting with who we are, what we want to do, what interests us, what we understand in the world, and what we understand about ourselves. Um, so once again, just thank you so much, Evie, for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you again. I really love the tone that is set here. All right. Well, with that, um, I want to encourage the rest of us here to uh, start a point of discussion, to talk about the book. If you've had the chance to read it, if you haven't had the chance to read it, um, we would love to introduce a resource that we at Supermajority put together in the hopes that we could aid in reading this book with young readers. Um, Emma has shared a link to the Google Doc in the chat, but I'm also going to ask Emma to share her screen so we can talk a little bit about the reader guide um, and 
But before we jump into it, I want to pass it to Grace and talk a little bit about why we decided to write this and sort of what inspired us. Yeah. So um, as we were reading, um, Jess and I actually were talking about how we were really excited to read this with our kids um, and how did we want to talk about it. And through all of this, it kind of we decided let's let's try and put something together. We had some ideas that we thought of. Um, and also while I was reading it, I realized I decided to do a little check on Massachusetts like state curriculum. Um, and in fifth grade, they really start trying to talk about some of these concepts and things like this. And so I'm kind of like, how can I also get this in the classroom? Because I think between the use of the poetry and prose, as well as some of the concepts that are talked about here, it could really add something wonderful to the curriculum. Um, so that is one of my actions going forward is to try and present this uh, and get this in front of the fifth grade teachers in my school district um, to see if they uh, will try and use this in their classroom. Um, but yeah, we have some conversation starters for you and um, talking about uh, the current timelines and comparing to Zygus, um, as well as some discussion prompts as well. Uh, and um, we also want to um, give you some guides on talking about neurodivergence uh, since in the story it does also uh, talk about how she was uh, diagnosed with dyslexia and um, you know, a lot of kids struggle with dyslexia. Some kids don't understand what it is. So giving you some resources on that as well. Uh, Jess, you wanna also take over? Yes, so um, as Grace mentioned, there are sort of two main sections to this guide. The first is conversation starters. Uh, we picked out the topics that really jumped front of mind to us, but also topics that can be a little bit difficult to discuss with young readers um, who are experiencing this world for the first time and are going through a lot of these um, really formative moments in their own lives. Um, I think our recommendation is, as you would expect, right? Let your reader be the guide on how you talk about things. Um, my own daughter today, we were discussing in the car and she said, why is it called a boycott and not a boy and girl cot? I'm sure there are lots of girls leading protests. Why don't we talk more about that? Um, and that became a discussion point for the two of us to discuss protest and um, all of these issues and where women fit into that. And, and her as a young girl, I think it's important to, to use her own thoughts and ideas and experimentation she's having in discussion. Um, so the, the first thread we pulled out was one that we talked about with Evie, and that is comparing this the 1950s zeitgeist with our current era having a conversation about similarities between then and now, differences between then and now, um, and really expanding that conversation based on your, um, your child's knowledge of, of the era, maybe what they're learning in school, things that, that match up to that and don't. Um, then we, we continued on to talk about how Junie's childhood, as she is called, Octavia's nickname was Junie because she was born in June, um, is that people in her life described her as a certain way and boxed her in and tried to keep her from doing certain things. She's described as slow by her teachers. She's written off. She's, you know, she's often just, her work is described as too weird and you really shouldn't be doing this. Why don't you do something else? And later in her life, she is diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, and so we wanted the chance, we thought this was a great opportunity to talk about neurodivergence with readers, have a discussion about different ways people learn and experience the world and also different ways that they learn themselves. Um, alternatively, this is also a moment to encourage young readers to follow their, their dreams and continue to participate in activities they love and believe in in themselves, even if other people might be um, casting doubt. Um, and then after we have a few more discussion pieces, we actually moved on to a couple of activity ideas you can run through with your readers. Um, so as we mentioned at the end of the discussion with EB, this, bio, this biography has a lot of poetry, but it has a lot of different structured poetry. So there's calligrams, which are the, there's a poem in the shape of a star. There's a poem in the shape of a, a moon and a circle. There's also an acrostic poem, haiku. Um, you see writing from Octavia Butler herself in this. And so we thought, wouldn't it be really fun for a reader to pick one of the poems in the novel and recreate it themselves, experiment with different ways that they could uh, you know, paint a picture while using words. Um, and then we also 
thought it would be a really interesting discussion for, for readers to draw a picture or write their own story, find something they love to do and experiment with that um, using the themes in the story. Um, so I really think this is a great jumping off point, but we wanted to use it as that, right? A jumping off point and would love to hear um, any ideas or thoughts, any ways you're thinking about how you'll approach this book with your, with your student or your daughter or your son or any person in your family that you wanna share this with. And I won't volunteer anyone, but I know at the beginning of this call, there were a lot of folks who were joining this discussion with their daughter or with their student. And so what I think would be great is if you want to share something or you want your young reader to, to join in this discussion to uh, drop that into the chat and then we can take you off mute and you can, you can share a question or idea you have. Well, don't feel like you'll need to come. Oh, yes, we have someone who'd like to share. All right, I'd love, I'd love to hear. I'm you. Oh, okay, I'm you. Hi. Um, I love this setup, by the way. Um, and um, because I am big bird, a bookworm, and um, but uh, based on what uh, this book is about, I wanted to wait. Hold on. I wanted, can you hear me? Okay. So, um, so this book was really fa like fascinating to me only because you don't see a lot of books like this. And it also taught me something in a way like, uh, it also that, um, ew, what? okay, close. Oh, hold on. It also taught me that um, being, um, and also, how can I say that do every weakness that we have, it's a strength behind it. That's what it showed me. And that's what June showed me in the book is within her weakness and, and with all the, you know, good and bad criticism, she used that bad, that negative criticism and she used it in her writing and her creative styles and to push other females and of all ways and diversity that they could do the same thing and and young young wider um could do so too and that's what i like about this book and i yeah that's it <laughs> i i totally echo those grace and i were discussing this book before we had on this call and one of the things i said was when I was when I was in middle school, failure was the ultimate no go. Right, I was so afraid to fail that if I if I would have been given a rejection, I would have completely given up whole hog. And the fact that she didn't that it actually caused her to want to write and submit more, I thought was just an incredible lesson for young readers and something I hope my own daughter picks up um, when she reads it. All right, I know we have someone on stack, so I want to invite Susan to uh, share as well. Hi, Susan, this is Emma jumping in from tech. You should see something on your screen asking you to unmute, but you can chat me or Jess or Grace if you do not see that on your screen. While, while we wait for Susan and the tech issues. Um, oh, uh, and uh, 
one of the things that I talked about with my son while we were reading it is we got into a discussion about a, um, a migration and what that meant in terms of people and talking about the great migration. Um, and then he really enjoyed looking at the poems in all of the different shapes. He, since he was little, was such a shape lover. He saw, saw shapes in everything. Um, and so to be able to show him poems in shapes of a star and the moon and whatnot, he just really enjoyed and it. it made him think about poetry in a different way. And we got into a discussion about asking like, if you were to make one, what would you be, yours be in? And he's like a dinosaur because he loves dinosaurs right now and things like that. So um, this book is just truly amazing. And I am so excited to continue reading this book with my son and then also going back with him a couple of years from now. Um, and going through this book again um, to see what else strikes his fancy and, and what other discussions we can have as he goes through um, his schooling and curriculum and everything. So um, we just want to go ahead and thank everybody for joining us today. Um, we enjoyed you all being here. Uh, thank you so much for Evie for coming on and sharing this book and having a wonderful conversation and being so honest and open with us. Um, we want you to all to, uh, come join us next month as we have Alice Wong joining us, um, talking about the disability visibility, uh, first person stories from the 21st century. It's going to be, uh, February 17th at 7 PM. So keep your eye out, look for it on social and in your emails. Uh, thank you all once again. So glad you are here um, and we could be in community with all of you once again. See you all soon. Uh, thank you. Bye.